Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, both on live stream and later on YouTube as well. Both uh, this broadcast will air in both places. And uh, who stole the Star of David? I know that Star of David is a very controversial subject to begin with. There are those that believe that the Star of David is, in fact, uh, the Star of Rempham or the Star of Molech that was worshipped uh, in biblical times. And yet, I have not had the opportunity in this particular broadcast to dive into this subject deeper. Uh, me and my wife have done a video before on the Star of David. And if you do have a different view on that, I respect your view on that as well. I'm not here to criticize different people and different beliefs on this. But this symbol does have uh, some very interesting archaeological artifacts that are part of the early believing Christians, believe it or not, or the early Nazarene community or, or Essene community, whatever you want to call them. And this evidence has been majorly suppressed by Israel specifically for a hidden agenda. And I think we're about to see what the hidden agenda is. So in our broadcast tonight, we call it Who Stole the Star of David? We know that the Star of David, by the way, can you can go back into even many mosques in the last uh, many centuries here and find the Star of David there. You can even find it in the Vatican. You can find it but one of the oldest known places is all the way back in Israel in the Sea of Galilee on an old synagogue, which is from the third century. That supposedly was one of the oldest known places for the Star of David, but it's not. There's even older places for the Star of David. But what really concerned me today, though, was a story that or a post that came out on Facebook and, of course, also on a story that was published as well on Israeli cool.com by Alsi Dave, uh, and Alsi Dave is very pro-Israel, which I'm pro-Israel myself. I'm not pro-political side that lines up and wants to do everything the Vatican wants, but I am pro the fact that I believe that God is bringing home the house of Judah first in order to make reconciliation for iniquity. So let me show you my stand there right from the very beginning of this video. And as far as the Star of David, we're going to look at some of these things behind this. But you have to realize, this video here is not, you know, even though we're going to be talking about the, the archaeological finds for this, but it is a suppression of information to keep, uh, to keep Israel from being able to gain control of the full land that is there now. And it is very much a cynical, diabolical plan and I think you might get an idea. Unfortunately, because of the rush to get this out, I wasn't able to do as much research as I would like to have done because I could really take you to a very depth of this that would really be a blessing, no doubt. Uh, and let me know in the comments if there's something that, that would bless you to know more about this because it is a contentious su subject, uh, especially in modern times. I have known, noticed in the last five years the hatred for the Star of David, even amongst the believers, has grown dramatically. And you guys may not realize this, but this has a lot to do with the propaganda of the Catholic Church to press this down. Now, they're not doing it directly, but indirectly they're doing this, uh, and it's become a symbol of anti-Semitism uh, in unbelievable propor uh, proportions there. Anyway, uh, Alsi writes here, Mahmoud Abbas faith claims Star of David as Islamic symbol. Uh, just a little quick thing he says here, as, a, as part of their bid to deny Jewish history in the Holy Land, Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah party is now claiming the Star of David is an Arabic Islamic symbol. Well, he's exactly right. This is what appeared on their particular uh, web page. That is the Fatah's web page. As you can see here, you have uh, Mahmoud Abbas featured, featured as the image of their party page. And... Uh, the former thug there in the background as well. Uh, anyway, though, I did notice, though, that the translation on, on uh, some of the other pages that were speaking about this were not uh, quite as good. I did use Google Translate. I did a little bit of comparison translations to see this is what was stated, and they just show a symbol of the Star of David. And, and it is true, you do find the Star of David on many of the mosques uh, throughout uh, the Muslim world. 
uh, as well as you find it even on some of the crowns that the popes have worn. Uh, now, just because it's on a moss, just because it's on the pope's hat, etc., does not necessarily make it a demonic symbol. If you're going to say that's a demonic symbol, then you might as well say that the hexagram that is on the United States flag is also a demonic symbol, which is used in many witchcraft circles. But we don't think of the United States flag as being a demonic flag just because it uses a hexagram that is also used in demonic circles. You know, we've we got to use a little bit of common sense, friends, in some of these things. Sometimes people really go to an extreme on this. Anyway, it says here on their political party, the Fatah's page, a six-pointed star or the Star of David, English code Islamist, was used in the Arabic Islamic architecture before the establishment of the Jewish state. Hundreds of years, especially in Andalusia, Morocco, Palestine, and carrying the symbol religious significance, monotheistic, which shows based on the acts of worship that ascend the sky triangle while indicating inverted triangle and the compassion that uh, lands on the ground that is emerging good deeds matching the mercy of a bear. And unfortunately, some of the simple people took at some uh, this icon in the old buildings for many years or changed his features since, uh, and has happened some of the, the mosque, uh, believing that this code is a Zionist symbol, knowing that the Mongolian and Islamic civilization in India used a six-pointed star. Now, I'm not surprised that it's used in India either. Really not. Uh, it's like, that's why I say I don't have time to go into as much as I would have liked to have gone into on this. But as far as the mosque, you have to remember that Islam is a, is a religion created by the Catholic Church in the first place. So it's no wonder the Star of David is actually on many of their own mosques. That is according to Cardinal B, uh, who revealed a lot of this to the former Jesuit um, uh, Alberta Rivera. And so we know that, and so it's not anything that I would not expect to see. Uh, why they necessarily put it there, I'm not sure, but there is a very interesting evidence that proves, though, that the Star of David actually at one time uh, is on some ancient artifacts that belong to the earliest church with St. James. Before we get there, let me show you, share with you another interesting point of view. This came, comes from uh, Zionism Now from November 5th of 2010, the Star of David versus the Crescent Moon. Now he's using on, if you go to this guy's website here and you look at it, it's very interesting. He does an extremely good uh, write-up on this. And every picture he uses is where the Star of David was on an ancient mosque. But he will show you clearly that it does stand for Israel uh, in, in, their t in times past. He deals with also a uh, very good argument. I use a little different argument, but he does deal with the Star of Molech or the Star of Remphan, which, by the way, uh, I have hundreds and hundreds of photos of the actual artifacts that I've taken myself of the Egyptian relics, uh, the, the time from Nimrod's time, etc. And the, the predominant star that is used in all of those circles that was representation even for the times of Molech or any of these types of, of demonic worship was always an eight-pointed star. I think only one time have I ever found a six-pointed star in all of this works here. But it's normally associated, the star of Molech, etc., from Nimrod and all these different ancient civilizations is an eight-pointed star. But then again, like I said, the hexagram is also used in demonic circles. But little kids take the little hexagram star and they play with it. They use it for little stickers. We see it on the American flag. It's on other flags as well. You know, we cannot become so obsessed with that. But I understand the ideology because of the fact that we see that they worship their star or their, their god, the god of Molech, their, and their star of Remphan. We see that biblically speaking. And that's what troubles a lot of people about the star of David today. But you have to remember, this particular six-pointed star of David doesn't even show up in Israel's history until at least this is in... Um, I know that there is one archaeological evidence that they suggest is the star of David of Solomon's star uh, is one. Uh, but as far as the only the oldest archaeological evidence we have is from Jerusalem, uh, excuse me, out of um, uh, and it's right here on this stone here at the old synagogue in, uh, up in the Galilee area. Uh, at, at Capernaum is where this is at. I actually took this picture myself. 
uh, at Capernaum. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Let me first read to you this quick article here by this man that wrote this uh, article from uh, Zionism Now. He said, the hexagram is not an original symbol of Judaism, such as the much older symbol, the menorah. The hexagram was adopted by Judaism to represent the famous King David and his offspring. Now, I really thought that was very interesting the way he spoke about this, because it is true. We can go back even to the wilderness journey. Ron Wyatt, who uh, discovered what I believe to really be the true Mount Sinai, uh, found uh, an ancient menorah carved in a stone out there in the desert, uh, on the other, uh, out there in, uh, at El, uh, uh, I got to get my brain to work because I wasn't even thinking about Ron to start with, but uh, El jo El, uh, uh, jo Jabal El Elaz, I believe is the name of that mountain there. It's the Mountain of Almonds, I believe is what they call it, because they used to have almond trees there. But anyway, he found the ancient menorah carved into there. But we don't find the Star of David back there on any of even those type artifacts that he found himself. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Ron Wyatt is an amateur archaeologist. He was actually a... Uh, 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 the type doctor that puts people to sleep or a nurse, whatever particular position he had there. But uh, he did do a lot of research out there. Never did he find the Star of David out there. So that, again, makes me wonder where, what type of star were they worshiping at that particular point. It's not to say that the Israelites didn't fall into all kinds of idolatry when they were out in the wilderness and Moses had to deal with that. But the Star of David... Uh, seems to be associated more so from the time of the promise that God gave David that he would have a son. All right, let's look at what the scripture says on this. The famous King David and his offspring also called the seal of Solomon with the Jewish community that from it would come the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. In Hebrew, Mashiach ben David, uh, he says. Uh, then he quotes from Numbers 24, 17. Now, this is the prophecy that speaks of that. There shall come a star out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth, or Sheth. Uh, that's in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. And there it is a star. Now, as again, if I'd have had more time to go into this, we, we have that Yeshua is referred to as a star as well. I believe it's in the book of Revelation. Um, he's the morning star, the bright and morning star. Uh, again, I know some people don't like that when you talk about the Star of David. My point is, though, is we have some proof, though, to back this up that the early church believed that Jesus truly was the fulfillment of the prophecy right back here. And that prophecy there is where out of Numbers 24, uh, a, a star out of Jacob. There shall come a star out of Jacob. See, the coming of the promised Messiah, the son of David, as we find out later. Uh, and, it, and it's believed that this is where the star first began to appear. But we don't have any archaeological evidence to support that that I'm aware of up until the time of the temple here until the messianic seal was discovered. Now, let me read to this. This, was, this again was off of the same guy's website except my own photograph I used. He says, in all known Judaism history, secular or religious, the hexagram shape never symbolized the God of Israel or any other deity. It always represented King David as his offspring. Concerning the everlasting covenant, uh, Yahuwah, made with him. This is why the symbol is called the Star of David or the Seal of Solomon in reference to David's son. Now, I thought that was a very interesting point there, but here's where it gets interesting, friends. And I'm going to share with you some very interesting information. Some of it I didn't have time to put it all up on the screen for you, but I'm going to share some with you. Um, this here is by uh, Mr. Schneider, uh, Mr. Schneider has passed away now. There is the book, The Messianic Seal of Jerusalem. I want to hold that for you. Now, Mr. Schneider did not write this book. Uh, it was written by a couple of other men, uh, but it was about what he experienced. It was about the discovery that, uh, that was given to him by an, uh, an elderly monk that would ended up mysteriously dying, which I do believe he was murdered. Of course, he was old. I'm not going to say he wasn't old now, but anyway, uh, in this here, and, and I, wrote, I took this from the, from the book itself. I put the ISBN number here for you on the screen in case you want to order this book, 965-222-962-8. 
Now, I don't know how well you can see on your screen there, but you guys are aware of the little messianic pins that they have that show uh, the fish symbol and the fish and the menorah and how they interlock together. And by the way, in, in the research that we have done, almost all of your ancient menorahs actually was made with a triangle on the bottom, en engraved in caves and everything else. I've seen these for myself. I know it's true. And of course, the fish tail was always like the triangle on the fish used during the time of, uh, of the early uh, Christian church, you might, uh, you were, the Messianic church, I would say, would be a better way to call them, uh, the Messianic believers. Uh, and then what happened was they took and they combined the menorah and the fish together. Now, in this particular artifact here, the stone that was discovered there in Jerusalem, it also uses a cross for the eye of the fish. Uh, very interesting artifacts. There were a bunch of these artifacts at the time when Mr. Schneider first uh, met the monk. Uh, the monk's name was Tech Otios. Uh, was his name. He was a Greek Orthodox monk uh, that had shared his discoveries that he had found back in the 60s with him. Um, let me just read to you what it says here. Herr Ludwig Schneider, uh, he was a German. In fact, there's only two videos online about him that I'm aware of, but they're both, they're, he's doing them, but they're in German. Received these artifacts in 1990 from a Greek Orthodox monk, Tech Otius, the monk I put on here myself was about 90 years old when he gave them to Schneider. If I remember right, that's what he said he was, about 90. He said, who had excavated them in the 1960s, a Bedouin also uh, and, and, uh, had uh, discovered an object in the Judean desert with the same seal in 1963. The artifacts that Schneider has were validated by, prof by a professor of archaeology at Dortmund University in Germany, as well as by an archaeologist in Israel. They were validated by both when he was first taking these things to have them checked to see the authenticity of them, that what, what were they really. Now, I didn't take this from the book. I just took some of the information from the book here in this part here. Um, but he does go, he has these things validated. They are dated to the first century by archaeologists and as well as by the professors at the German University Dortmund uh, in Germany. Now, he had several of these artifacts, and here are some. Some of these are pottery. There were all kinds of the artifacts there with the Messianic seal, as it's come to be known, the menorah, the fish, etc. But when they linked them together, as you can see, it forms the Star of David. Uh, and what I'll do for those of you that catch this on YouTube, those of you watching on live stream right now, I will actually zoom in on this, on this one of these artifacts for you so you can see this for yourself, get a better view of this uh, without just having to look it up online. But it formed that Messianic seal. Now, the, the, this, the thing is, is when he first discovered this, uh, and this here, this is... Uh, uh, Mr. Schneider right here, and he has since passed away. Passed away. Um, and I, and I'm, before too long, I will actually uh, get the, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to get the privilege to actually see these objects myself firsthand uh, and up close uh, very soon here. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the book here, it states here, Otios the monk took Mr. Schneider to an old mikvah close to King David's tomb. There on the wall was carved out the Messianic seal. Now, I know where that mikvah is. And since the death of Mr. Otios, uh, the Israeli authorities totally encaged it with huge, gigantic uh, steel gates and everything where you cannot get in there anymore. Uh, this is really something that they wanted to stop. They wanted to hush it. But let me first read to you a little bit about this first, and then we're going to go into this more. He says, in my initial excitement, I rushed back to the priests of the monastery to report this incredible find. I was shocked by the audience I received. They rebuffed me, refused to answer my questions about the seal, and locked me outside the monastery gate. All right, now let me just, let me back up, because I know it seems a little confusing, and I forgot I wrote it like this. What happens here was Mr. Schneider had befriended an old Greek monk there, in, uh, right there near the tomb of David. They'd become good friends. The old monk lived in that particular area there 
Um, and they would often talk with one another. And, uh, and the old monk said to him one day, he wanted to share something with him that he had found. And uh, so at first, though, Mr. Schneider was always kind of leery of wanting to go back with him where he lived at because it was just an old, dirty, dilapidated old, like a cave, so to speak, where he was living at. But one day he finally agrees to go. And when he does, he shares with him uh, for the first time one of these pieces right here, a couple or a couple of these pieces here with these ancient inscriptions in them of the Messianic seal. This made Mr. Schneider just exuberant to see this. He was so excited. And then what he did, uh, the, the old monk then takes him down, takes him by the hand, takes him around to this old meek, but back then it was just a little fence uh, keeping people out, but you could still get in. And they went over the little fence there and he goes down inside of this little catacomb and he takes him there. It begins to get a little bit dark there. I guess he'll use a flashlight or something. And then he shows him on the wall. The same thing is engraved inside of this little building here. Uh, and then, of course, he's all excited about this information. Uh, and thinking that the Catholic Church is going to receive him, he runs to the monastery that's right there. I mean, literally, the monastery where this is all at is literally less than, I would say, 50, feet, 50 yards away. 50, 60 yards, something like that. That's how close it is to this grounds here. And he goes there, excited about this, and then he gets... He gets thrown out and locked out of the place. All right, now let me read to you what happens next. Then he goes, he goes to the curator of the Israeli uh, museum there in Israel. He says, was most friendly. He said, even gracious, I was ushered into his office with the pictures of the eight pieces which he examined with careful and studied interest. Because he, he only brought pictures to him. He's a little bit, after what happened at the monastery, he's a little bit more cautious. He then told me, matter-of-factly, that the museum already had seen other artifacts with this very same three-part three symbol and that it had come to them from other sources which he did not specify. The curator assured me that the museum had firm plans to have a special exhibit exhibition of these artifacts and their unique symbol and that the near future this was in 1990. Quite frankly, I am not surprised that these artifacts or three-part symbol which they are adorned have as of yet, as far as I know, never emerged, nor have has any information about them. Israeli officialdom perhaps was afraid of what the world might think of it, of the truth became known. The early church was Jewish and the original believers in Jesus were Jews. All right, now, he became, of course, he became extremely frustrated over the system because one, the Catholic Church, who you think would embrace this, especially since they have that Star of David on the Pope's crown, all right, and since they included it on the Islamic buildings, which they're the mother of the harlots, uh, you know, but the problem is, is they couldn't have a new idea of what early Christianity really was. They want you to believe the Catholic Church's version of early Christianity. And this discovery here, as well as the one that was done by a Bedouin out in the Judean desert, kind of wonder where that might be at. Maybe Qumran, perhaps? See, if they're suppressing the evidence here, you know what they are doing at Qumran. They're suppressing it there as well. And let me tell you something. There's people out there right now that criticize what I tell you when it comes to Qumran and the Catholic Church suppressing information. Well, we got bold facts right here, and there are there are also scholars who have worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls and photographed them themselves that came out and have said that there were writings in there about the early believers of Yeshua and they, they, they tried to run that man in the ground and everything else and called him a heretic and stuff and said it was all a fabricated lie, but yet their evidence is there that they know he was on that team and he worked with that. All right, so the evidence is there. Now you have Mr. Schneider who in his own test Testimony. A, a good German man, his wife still living today, lives in Israel. See, good standing man. Uh, but now they don't want no evidence. Now, it did, it did become known that people do make the little trinkets and stuff. He even opened up a shop himself there uh, in Jerusalem, but the, he was run out of business. Uh, his, his place was stoned by the Orthodox Jews. But what is it? Why are the Jews and the Catholic 
church trying to suppress the truth of these things. They don't want you to know that St. James was the leader of the church. They don't want you to know that he was put in charge of the church in Jerusalem. I'm not saying that Peter wasn't also, Peter was put, put at the head of the church like Jesus said. I agree with that. But the problem is, is Peter didn't do what they said as far as Rome. Peter was never the first pope of Rome. See, it begins to, un, you know, then, then the questions have to come in. What about the other artifacts? What are they hiding then? You know, right? So we know that they wanted to suppress this. Facts are there. Facts are there about Qumran as well. All right? And to this day, it's still suppressed. Archaeological people are never going to let you know. Why? And I said this back even before this article came out today, uh, the articles that are coming out over this issue of the Star of David, and it's come out before too, about the, 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 they're trying to say that the Jews stole the Star of David. Well, I, I showed you a little bit ago where it was on the synagogue, okay? This is in the third century. Third century, synagogue in Capernaum there in Israel. Uh, now that's debatable. It could be even the first century. It could be the, from the time of Yeshua. All right, but it is believed by archaeologists there. So I give it benefit of the doubt. That's from that time period. Uh, so again, so those of you that say, okay, it's the star of Rimfam, then why did it show up on the Messianic seal? Why was it found in St. James's church? Okay, this is where it's actually found at St. James's church. By the way, as I said, when uh, he came back, his friend was dead and all of the artifacts were gone, except for the few that were given to Mr. Uh, uh, Schneider. And that was the one they couldn't get a hold of. I guess they'd kill somebody else if they could get away with it. Who knows? Anyway, it doesn't end there, though, friends. This is the whole point. Let me, let me explain to you. This is a... It's a big issue, and this, there is a reason why. The Vatican, believe me, they put that Star of David on these different Islamic places for a reason. Because they knew after 70 AD, when Israel, come, when Israel was destroyed by the Romans, later the Romans lost power over the Middle East. Then you had the Turkish Empire that came in there. So, when, all right, so somewhere along the way, when the Vatican de decided to create Islam, to, to also to eradicate the true believing Christians back then and also to eradicate Jews they didn't like. But the Vatican has always wanted to get back into Israel. So even in the last, uh, I forget, I think you can go back about 700, 800 years or so. That's about how far back you go and you find it, or maybe not, I'm sorry, not even that far. My apologies. Uh, you go back about 500 years, 400 years, and old mosque, you find some of these stars there. I believe this is, this is just conjecture on my part, but I believe it's been the Vatican's purpose to place them there because they have a plan for this star in order to justify that the Palestinians get they own the land. That's what they want to do is justify that it's the Palestinian land, that it's not the Jewish people's land. And these are not Palestinians, friends. These are Jordanians. Okay, Jordanians who... When the British give a mandate, they gave a mandate for Jordanian people. They gave a mandate for the Israeli people or for the Jewish people. There were two mandates given. There was a country formed called Jordan in 1946, and that was given to the Jordanians, which are also part of what they call the Palestinians today. But instead of them going to the land that, that was mandated for them, they stayed in the land that was mandated for the Jews, for their own home state. So when the Jews had to go ahead and try to fight for their land two years later, they had to fight a war for theirs. The Jordanians didn't have to fight a war for theirs. It was just given to them by the British mandate. All right. Of course, the British had taken over it back in World War I. So the British, I guess you would say, was an occupying force at that time. But nonetheless, the Jews did fight for their land, and they lost the West Bank. The Jordanians won the West Bank and annexed it in 1954. All right, so then later in the Six Days War, 1967, Israel wins the war, and now they take, they don't, they don't throw out the Palestinians from the Six Days War, but they do take Jerusalem and they take control of it, and they take militarily control of the West Bank at that point. And since then, it's been a, it's been a source of contention ever since. And it has also caused a major problem for the Vatican. This is why the has been pushing for this two-state solution the entire time. They need to get that land. So the Vatican is willing to alter history. They're willing to lie. Everything that they have to do, 
in order to make sure they get a hold of this land and take it from the Jews so that they can have their own little, they want their headquarters there, we should say. Now, to show you how serious these issues are, this right here is Jean Torrent. He is the famous Jean-Louis Torrent, the famous French cardinal in the Vatican that stated there will be no peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved. No peace. That's a man that's bound on causing war and conflict in the Middle East. Now, this is on uh, Guglio Miato's article, Israel National News. Uh, the Vatican wants to lay its hands on Jerusalem. You need to read the entire article. Peace negotiations in the Middle East must tackle the issue of the status of the holy sites of Jerusalem. Cardinal Jean Torrent, headed of the Vatican's Council of Interreligious Dialogue, declared several days ago in Rome, back in 2011, December 15th. Now, keep in mind, this, this has everything to do with the Star of David thing. Because you have to understand, the Star of David, now we're starting to see a push. It's just getting started, again, of a reclaiming of the Star of David by the Palestinian people. They're claiming that star to justify that the land belongs to them. To give them weight to get a two-state solution to give them weight to get Jerusalem. And that way, too, if there's more artifacts discovered with the Star of David on there, they can lay claim and say it's an Islamic artifact, when in fact it's not. Now, why would the Vatican actually have the Star of David in the first place? Remember, the Scripture says that there'd be a star that rises out of Jacob. Yeshua is... That star. He is the morning star. He is represented that way. We know that. We can't say that he's not. It's true. He is represented as a star. All right? And yes, the, the, the Israelites were guilty of worshiping their star of their god, Molech. I agree with that. All right? But it doesn't, you can't take away from the fact that Yeshua was also represented by a star. So we can't get so technically and critical about every single little thing, guys. I mean, seriously. All right, now watch what happens here. Jean Torrent makes, makes this statement back in December 15, 2011. And guess what? Miss Hillary Clinton, she was given some advice by Thomas Pickering, the former U.S. ambassador to Israel, of just what to do after Jean-Louis after Jean Torrent, the French cardinal, had said there won't be any peace, then, and this is on the Jerusalem Post, no holds barred torrent of anti-Israel advice found in Hillary's emails. This came out February of 2016. Thomas Pickering, former U.S. ambassador to Israel, wrote to Clinton on December the 18th, three days later, and suggested a secret plan to stir up major Palestinian protest in an attempt to force the Israelis government into peace negotiations. Three days later, who's calling the shots? The Vatican is. He says there's not going to be any peace unless you deal with what we want. You give me what I want or you're not going to have any peace. Remember Daniel's prophecy? They come up strong with a small people. That's the prince that shall come. The prince that shall come is of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Last I recalled, that was the Romans. Is that right? Isn't that what Esau, or excuse me, isn't that what Obadiah says? Obadiah accuses Titus, the Roman general, as being a descendant of Esau and says he stood aloof while his brother's city was ransacked and the temple was destroyed and carried back the artifacts from the temple with him. Now, Obadiah accuses that in prophecy. And it happened that way, too. Obadiah saw it before it was going to happen and knew that Esau's descendants would be guilty of it, and it was the Romans. And Titus did stand aloof. He was not... He, he orchestrated the battle, because you have to remember, the Romans had already conquered Assyria by this time. Like for 30, 40, 30 years, I think, before the destruction of the temple, they'd already conquered Assyria, so now they were, they were loyal subjects to them. And of course they'd be loyal subject to the Romans. Esau's descendants are married into the Assyrians to begin, or the Assyrians to begin with. That's what Ben-Hadad, 
ben, or not ben Hadad, but Hadad himself, the sole surviving heir of Esau that escapes to Egypt, goes into Syria, becomes the king of Syria. His descendants, ben Hadad, also a reigning king of Assyria. Later, we find, according to Obadiah, they end up in Rome. Now the descendants are there, part of Titus's conquest over Israel, the destruction of the temple, the very the Ark of Titus showing that they carried the temple artifacts and menorah back in with them there. They didn't get everything, but they at least they got the menorah and, and some other things too, too, according to the Ark there that shows what they stole from the temple. Now, now they're trying though, the Vatican has those, has those artifacts. Don't think they don't. They do. I know the Vatican wasn't created as of yet, but believe me, if the Vatican's got all the statues in Rome inside the Vatican, you can count on one thing, they got that menorah too. All right? Now, Abbas responds to Netanyahu, no Middle East peace without East Jerusalem as a Palestinian capital. They're doing just whatever the Vatican says do. Because the Vatican has come up strong with a small people. And they're using now, and maybe, maybe this has been the plot from the very beginning to use the Star of David. Maybe this is one of the reasons, too, why they didn't want that messianic seal to come out and that evidence to be there that the Star of David was associated with the Jewish people originally. Even though it was the messianic Jews of early, the, the apostles, etc., it was associated with them. Maybe they didn't want that coming out because the plan was all along, well, we got the, we got the Star of David on the mosque and stuff. It shows that it's an Arabic symbol because why? They always knew that the Jews would never Never be willing to just give them Jerusalem. The Vatican knows that. And by the way, for those of you that do not believe the Star of David regardless, then why does God put it everywhere in nature? Why is it in the flowers? Why, why the very lily? Is not Jesus himself, Yeshua HaMashiach, is he not called the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star? And the lily of the valley is in the shape of the star of David. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them. In the shape of the star of David. Maybe we're getting just too technical, guys. You know? I, I do realize there was a star ramp in. I do. I understand that. And I, and I appreciate that. If this is what you feel, you have every right to do so. But I don't agree with that when I see that it was associated as part of the Messianic seal. It's an archaeological fact. I've been to where St. James had the church. And I'll be there again very soon. It's not a place that's open to the public, by the way, either. So I'll try to bring you some of that information. If there's any way possible I can get in there and show it to you directly myself, I will. But I will bring you some more artifacts that I can do, anything I can to prove some of these points here. So don't just, if you've been part of that side of saying that it's just, oh, it's the star, star of Ram fam, you know, prayerfully consider that. Prayerfully consider it, because there's a lot of evidence that proves otherwise. It is a stolen star. It's stolen by Satan. His star probably is the eight-pointed star, as you see in the other things. But you know, you got to remember, God is the one that created the stars of heaven. And how many times do we see that when they, like even the sun, when the sun raises, many times people take photographs, it comes out with the light rays flickering off the camera, like a star of David there as well. You know, just but stars... You know, anybody can use something for evil. Satan took and perverted everything he possibly can for evil. But it doesn't mean that we have to pervert everything. Let's think about that, friends. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live. Shalom, and God bless you. God bless those of you that are watching on live stream as well. Hope it's been a blessing for you. Shalom.